I was a bit stunned. Uh, because I normally would have thought centers of social power as not being directly connected to formal power. So I had to sort this out as best I could. And then I thought well, perhaps what was intended here was we have to understand the interstimulation of social power and formal power. There's a dynamic here that we maybe need to understand better. Now, if I were just to separate out for a moment what we conventionally mean by social power, well, this is what people generally talk about. They say social power is about classes and the dominance of classes in society are the fundamental causes of the power of society, and they can take the the Marxist do so. If you understand law, understand what the ruling class is. Because it's the class that rules, that it can rules. It's not something it's the law. Uh, then, of course, you could, because not many people have been happy with the reductionism of class analysis, they could go on with, well, no, no, society is more effectively run by elites. So you really have to understand how elites function and how they orchestrate things, how they orchestrate new classes. To get a real sense of where the power lies in a society. <clears throat> there has not always been satisfactory as well. No. And then, well, there are people who separate them. Society is very complex. Lots of different groups and so on. And the better explanation of power in society, less a sense of pluralism. Society is fragmented in groups and groups, and like the ruling group of class of the right? they orchestrate these different sectors of society, and they can be organized around any value, religion, wealth, uh, social class, and so on. Uh, another version of this explanation of social power is the notion of consociation. Now, what consociation means is that there are some, uh, the society is divided up into very uh, tightly orchestrated, tightly identified segments. The easiest would be, well, society is divided by, by ethnicity, or by religion, or by language, or some such thing. And so what we say is the, 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 the guys who really organize things and rule things, they really orchestrate the segments, try to assure their interests are represented in the framework of, of policy for body politics. <clears throat> then, um, in addition to the consociationism, there's a, a, a more radical idea of how to explain power, and it deals with the effort to understand uh, better micro-social relations because if you can understand them you'll understand where the true repository of the perspective of community is. In other words, if you have a, a keen sense of looking at small groups, the question is how do you do that, uh, what you will understand is that small groups are frequently the groups that generate the norms that may ultimately end up as human rights norms. But you really have to understand the business of micro-social interaction and how they impact on power in society. Um, our former president um, worked out a, a theory to do this based on uh, the idea of communications. Who, in whatever size group, communicates what to whom, with what result, and with what effect. It's those outcomes that give you a sense of the, shall we say, the aggregate of, of normative and other understanding of the society that ultimately shape whatever groups there are, whatever law there is, etc. <clears throat> so, so those are some of the, the, the main ideas. And the question then is, uh, how do these shape or affect the law? Well, we have one very interesting experiment done by a colleague of mine, 
uh, here in Article called the Basic Law of Constitution of Small Group. NASA in the 60s was interested in figuring out how do small groups behave if they're going on a trip to Mars or somewhere in the far distant future. What rules are going to govern them? How would they create rules to govern them? And this experiment was a small group of Berkeley students who were put into a penthouse. They were in the initial study was called the Penthouse Astronauts, and second was the basic role function of a small group. And what my colleague determined was that in the small group, uh, you eventually emerge with a, a reasonable allocation of basic decision making competences. So the different part participators. Uh, had certain roles which they clearly understood. There was no written constitution. It was a purely behavioral constitution. Now, this was a quite interesting insight because we normally think of constitutions as things that are written down. But here you had a, a living constitution of small groups, well understood, and it seemed to work. Mm. Some earlier anthropological studies, Llewellyn and Hobart and others, had actually written a very famous book on the Cheyenne, or the Cheyenne Way. And the Cheyenne didn't have a written text of culture. But they had developed constitutional understandings. Soldier societies, how disputes are to be adjudicated, managed, and so on. Again, all done without a constitution. And so that seems to indicate that uh, <coughs> you can generate some understandings about to, to manage their affairs in ways that hopefully are, are useful and productive. So, so that gives us a bit of a clue as to the possibilities of how social power connects up with constitutions and legal power. And I believe this is one of the least understood aspects of our modern law and sociology today. And that is, uh, we have difficulty saying that the United Nations Charter is a constitution. But it's very difficult to find out and then we, those who deny that it's a constitution, why it's not a constitution. Now, what you need to do is to understand that uh, however society is organized, uh, there are, I think, two fundamental outcomes in the absence of any other understanding. One, Societies, because of the competition for value, needs, wants, will generate conflict. Two, they will also generate cooperation. So these are two latent possibilities in any form of group organization, I think I would say. In this sense, we can say that when we, when we look at the beginnings of a constitution, whether written or not written, it will be because the contesting parties had a conflict. Uh, one side won, the other didn't, or they both figured out they couldn't win and needed some kind of an understanding. But either way, they would have to work out some system in which they can allocate the basic governing decision-making uh, aspects of the social universe that we occupy. If they work that through, they will have established the first uh, fundamental principle of constitutional learning, how to manage an institutionalized power in, in, in reasonably peaceful ways. Now, this doesn't mean that if you do this, you will abolish conflict. But what often will happen is, in a successful constitution, you will develop other mechanisms to manage conflict. So you may solve conflict by adjudication, by mediation, arbitration, conciliation, and any other method by which you can solve a problem. Uh, in other words, it gives you the opportunity not to continue, shall we say, by the conflict, but to change the form of the conflict. So if you look at the history of the United States today, you'll see the last 200 or plus years, there have been a lot of conflicts ending up in the Supreme Court. So they resolved it. Sometimes people don't like what the court is done, but none of this. Yeah. Now the question then is, um, if you want to understand this interrelationship or interdetermination of 
a constitution and a social process, uh, is there a way to do this best? And our colleague then developed what he called a, a system of contextual language. If you want to understand, first of all, the interplay between precise features of the social process and precise features of the constitutional system, you need some way to map it so you can see it. <clears throat> the, the questions that you would ask is, first, yes. who are the participants? To identify them is very important. Oh, it's not up. Oh, I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> this, is, this is a conflict of our constitutionalism here. Uh, and so I, I could go through the list, but when you come to the second heading, who the participators are, what perspectives do they bring to the process? Uh, their identifications. They're not all the law. Are you a domiciliary? Are you a citizen? Are you a refugee? What are, what are you? Because a great deal uh, of how you answer that question will, of course, uh, uh, determine uh, the scope of your rights and, uh, and obligations. And then there are demands. We know that all human beings have wants, needs, and desires. Well, you have to have an articulate framework to express those. How do you do that? And then finally, you can't demand everything. There are some limits. We, we draw from Freud the notion of expectations, or, or there are some, uh, we accept some limits. Uh, I want this, but I can't have everything. Um, and then we, we can go through with the what basis of power are available to the social participators as they engage in the constitutional process? I can run through the list of those things, but certainly the courts and political power plays, that'll help them. And then we go to, uh, where did this thing happen? How institutionalized is it? Uh, how geographically defined is it? How do they function in the context of a crisis and in the context of normalcy? I, I, I could do it. And then finally we come to um, the, the, the strategies. The strategies, you know, maybe litigation, maybe you know, a real conflict situation, armed conflict, mobilization of some force, coercion, persuasion. Those would be extent in, in virtually any con constitutional system. And finally, it's what are the outcomes? Does the constitution work? How does it work? Is it fraught with conflict? What are the frameworks that we can use to, to modify, change, or, or, or give it a better and more constructive version. So, so, that, so you can map it, and you can map that onto a constitutional system, so that you can have a very precise connection between the social dynamics and what actually happens at the constitutional level.